thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting this talk to you. So um, this is the topic I will present, Rays of Graph Databases, Data Spaces and their relations with linked data and ontologies. You can, if you wish, you can stop and do questions. You know, it's, it's a kind of uh, interactive presentation, OK? So the first thing is why I'm doing this research. So um, uh, the, uh, there is an, uh, an area in computer science now, OK? We call it science, which uh, it starts from the, 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 the science itself. So the basic idea is you do science, and uh, you, so you, you, you have the Earth in biology, and you study the Earth, and you get uh, uh, samples, do experiments, and so on. And you do that now using computers. Okay, you, you, you must use computers and informatics to do that, okay? So the idea of e science is that uh, we study, you studying <laughs> something. Or I, our research is how uh, scientists do research, uh, but mainly, mainly not, but necessarily using computers. But for this reason, is. Uh, an idea of uh, we study that in computer science. So the the object of our science is your science when computers are involved. Okay. So uh, Jean Grey, which is a famous researcher, uh, worked in Microsoft, and but it has a long story of uh, in the area of databases mainly. It did a talk, talk talking telling that uh, is science is one uh, information technology meets scientists. And uh, one interesting thing, they, they published a book about uh, what they call force paradigm. The, the basic idea is, is uh, if we, we got the, the first paradigm in science, it, it was empirical. So you, you observe the world, and you describe it, and so on, and so forth. And the, and the second wave or in the second, uh, so few hundred years ago, there is the theoretical branch. So we produce models and theoretical things to explain the world. In the last few decades, we have the computational branch in the sense that now you have computational power and you can even simulate things. So, okay, so you can produce a model and simulate by using a model and see something. So some people uh, tell that this is uh, research in silico, okay? Insta instead of in vitro, is in silico in the sense that the silico of the ship. But today we have a fourth paradigm, which is the basic idea is a kind of unifying theory. All the things produce data, and a lot of data. And uh, if uh, our challenge now is how can we put together and we can uh, uh, analyze and study things over the data, OK? So uh, this is the context. And uh, I will talk about graph database. And uh, uh, a, bit in, uh, a quick introduction, a graph database is a graph uh, is when the graph is the basic data model of a database, OK? If I'm thinking that I use star graphs, OK, as it is. This is a graph database. And why graphs? Why graphs are important? And this is one thing uh, uh, which is important to understand. And I have several reasons to convince you that now graphs are highly important, OK? I'll talk about the web effect. Uh, sharing and interconnecting and complex networks. First, uh, I will talk about the linked data, which is under the web effect. Who knows linked data? Who knows exactly how, what is linked data? No? Nobody? You a bit? OK. So uh, you know Wikipedia, right? And you know that Wikipedia has these info boxes here, OK? And the, the, the thing in this info box, which is highly important, is, for example, if you went in, in France, 
in Paris, for example, okay? You have an info box there telling, okay, Paris is inside Ile de France, and which is inside, uh, for example, France or something. So you can, in, uh, in Wikipedia, you can have a lot of connections uh, of things, right? And the interesting thing is they are so well organized, which is possible for a machine to extract these things, okay? So a group, uh, a research group called DBpedia, started to extract this data, okay, and put in a graph. So, for example, now Paris becomes an edge, Ile de France an edge, France an edge, and so on and so forth, and I can have labels on the relations. For example, this is a region, this is a country, and so on and so forth. So I can have a graph with all this information, okay? And there is an important thing. Each, each uh, node of the graph has what we call URI. So it's a unique identifier in the world, okay? So it's a concept, for example, if now I want to produce something and I want to uh, tell that this something that I'm producing is in Paris, I can use this URI and it will be connected to this graph here, okay? Uh, but how much information they got? They have quatro, four million of things, okay? 3.22 million, okay, is classified in a consistent ontology, automatically extracting from Wikipedia, okay? So they have uh, this number of persons, places, creative works, organizations, species, diseases, extracting data from Wikipedia. And uh, they also got the international Wikipedia, so they have uh, 119 languages. So uh, this is the number of things, and they they interlinked 16.8 million of things in different languages. And for example, Google Translate use that, for example, to help you to translate things. You know that it uses that. So uh, what happened is the Wikipedia started as this. Uh, huge database of concepts here interlinked, okay? And it is highly important. And, that, and then um, Tim Berners-Lee launched. Tim Berners-Lee is the, the, the guy who, uh, uh, who started to, to, to build the web concept. Uh, it designed the HTTP and, and so on and so forth. And he is involved in also you know, in semantic web. And, and he proposed that we must publish our data in such a way that, we, for example, we can use URIs to uniquely identify things and try to connect to other things. So, for example, consider I have uh, this music brains here, which is a base of music, okay? And I want to tell that this specific band uh, 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 is from some countries, from Paris, for example. Instead of put a label Paris, I will put a link to the to the URI of Paris of the Wikipedia. So now I can connect the information and it starts like that. Some bases started to connect things, geonames, uh, uh, United States Census data, and so on. Gutenberg project. This is 2000. Seven, May, May 2007, and in November, it, it, this is the size of linked data. In 2008, 2009, each node there is a base, is a big database, okay? 2010, 2011, so they stopped <laughs> to do the census in 2011 because now it's, it's huge, okay? So you may imagine that all these things <laughs> are interconnected. So you have a huge database as a graph, and you can query it. You can ask things, even connect to bases. Okay, I have students doing that now. So it's a kind of huge base of many, many things you may imagine interconnected. This is the linked data. Another why graphs a second argument is social networks and social content. 
So we produce things in networks, okay? So for example, consider you, you enter in a base who has pictures, okay? Like uh, Flickr. And you want to find a pet. You put the word pet, okay? So Flickr will try to find something that means pet. But pet can have many meanings, okay? So could be pet shop boys. I don't know if that you are looking for, but probably not. So, but uh, consider you have these results here, okay? But I will not tell you which results are that. You can just look the tags, okay? So consider that the authors put these tags here, okay? And then you look on these guys, and I want to ask you, which kind of pet we are talking about here? animals as pets, right? And how you do you know that? Because you can see the other uh, words that follow pet, okay? And these other words that follow pet give some kind of context, okay? We're probably here talking about a cat, a dog, and so on and so forth. And if I get these pictures here, and I ask you, is the same context? Now you see plastic bottle, recycle, so pet here is probably this material you do plastic bottles, right? So the first group is this one of pictures, <coughs> and the second one is this group of pictures. But then you can tell me, okay, Andre, but this is because you know what's a cat. You know what is a bottle. But if I don't know, can I even in this case know the, 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 the meaning of these tags? And I will show you that I can, okay? So let's consider the following. There is, a, there is a lot of research in this area, trying to go to the tags and get some meaning of that, okay? So what they do, they divide the group in three groups here. There are the tags, the users, or the re users, and the resource, okay? And then you have this thing. Users tag some resources with some uh, tags, okay? And from this graph, you start to do your analysis. For example, you can see that uh, there is a group of uh, tags of pet which appears with these words, but not frequently appear with these words, okay? And vice versa. So you can find kind of two clusters, and you can even produce two graphs, okay? In this graph, I have pet with one meaning. And in this graph, I have pet with other meaning. I don't need even to know what these words mean or these words means. I just know that there are two meanings for pet, which are different, okay? And I can, and I can go even further. For example, I can get uh, nodes together like that, okay? And I can see that, for example, whenever I see cat, I see pet, dog, pet, mouse, pet, and, and I see animal, okay? And here I see snake without pet, because usually it's not a pet, and animal here, tiger, animal here. So I can infer, and there are a lot of work, research work that does that. I can infer a kind of hierarchy of some general terms that comprise more specific terms, okay? So there are interesting works where they go in this, uh, in these social networks, get millions of tags and produce a kind of hierarchy automatically is impressive. Okay, and another thing is, uh, for example, in some kind of networks, uh, is not just tags. Okay, so if you go, for example, to delicious, it suggests you tags. So in delicious network, for example, you put bookmarks. Okay, so when you put the bookmarks, other persons also added the same bookmark. Okay. So what Delicious does, when you want to put the tags, it suggests you tags. It reinforces tags for you. So what happens is there are tags that are more used and less used, and then you have weights, and you can even better know that this represents more a cat and a kitty, and you can relate these words and so on and so forth. So I have a, a, with a research with a student where we, we a kind of analyze it, a kind of survey of several uh, works in this area, and we saw that most of these works departs from the 
graphs using weights of correlations of tags. And then they, they get tags and put in groups the call tag sets. The idea here is each node here is a concept instead of just a word. Okay? So uh, uh, it's like trying to go towards an ontology. So if, for example, several words have the same root, okay, or they are synonyms, you can put them together and, and call you have a tag set. So you can produce the same graph now, but instead of having tags, you have uh, concepts or tag sets, okay? And from that, several authors produce what m much, much people call social ontology or folksonomy or something like that. The basic idea is try to produce a kind of uh, taxonomy of generalization and specialization just getting data on the web. This is highly limited until now because, for example, they just get this kind of relation here, specialization and generalization, okay? And we, we did a work where we crossed this information with an, real ontologies, okay? And then we produced something we call folksonomized ontology, which have social information uh, mixed with an ontology. And I'll show you further what we can do with that. So uh, the, the meaning of pet need, needs the meaning of the other tags. If you saw Matrix, okay, the movie, <laughs> there is a scene there that they tell, what's the meaning of the word love? Uh, it asks for a program. Interaction. <laughs> yeah? Interaction. Yeah? Interaction. Interaction. The, the uh, interaction is the name of the... No, ah. the Indian guy replies, ah. interaction. It tells it is a word, not? It's just a word. Yeah, it's just a word. Yeah. yeah. The meaning is it, right? Yeah. So it's like that. So it's like we produce meaning based on correlation and statistics. This is something interesting. But why graphs? Another uh, uh, motive is sharing and interconnecting. Okay, so... Uh, let's consider the models we use to describe things. So, for example, I have some dinosaurs here, a plesiosaurus, for example. This is for uh, uh, the, the museum here, okay? So, that's the number here, you see, and then the species, origin, and so on and so forth. And we have other, uh, other dinosaurs here, okay? And we want to put these uh, dinosaurs in some kind of storage, okay? The classic approach is the uh, table, okay, relational table. We see, we put everything in a table, and that's fine. We put the, we create fields here, but we need a schema. We need to design a schema and put them in this table. The problem is a table is excellent to manage data with predictable, predictable static schema. So if it's static and it's predictable, it's fine. But once, when you want to change it, and when we want to share, we have problems. Why, why is hard to share? Because this table are designed to be all together in a database. And, you want to, or, and then you want, if you want to share something, you share the database or you share, you cannot just send a table because it's related with other tables and make no sense. So then we go to XML. We tell, okay, XML is good. Is better than that because then in XML we put everything we need in something we call document, which is hierarchical, okay? And then it's fine, but in fact, what we start to see is we produce a several of these hierarchical trees describing all of our uh, animals here. But then you see. You, you start to see, okay, this guy, he tell a place, Lyme Regis, Regis, and this is the same place. So I would like to connect them, okay? I would like to connect that to that, this species to this species, this uh, country with this country. Okay, can XML do that? Yes, it can. You can produce ca kinds of connections, and the SDD format, for example, does that. But it does inside the same document. Okay? And if you try to do in several documents, it's also possible, but it's a kind of crazy thing. Okay? It's not designed to do that. 
Okay, so one when you want to start to do these things is is a problem. So the question is how much hierarchical is your data? Your data is not in fact hierarchical. Okay, we use XML files only because we are uh, we 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 have the habit of shared documents, and XML is since a document, so seems an interesting approach to share things. Okay, but our data data is not in fact hierarchical. So let's go back to the table, because I, I told you, OK, we must connect things. And the tables are good to connect things, OK? The problem, another problem in tables, and in fact, when you have schemas, is sometimes you want to do relations that are not designed in advance. For example, I want to tell that I have two records in my database here, and these three ceratops here are a new name we did for this old record here, but it's not, it's not in our schema that. And I want to tell that this region is near this region, but it's not previewed in the schema. And I want to tell that the country includes the place, and I want to tell that all these guys are the Museum of Sarnatra. So nothing of these things are in the schema. And what happens? The users start to ask, ah, I want to put the, change the schema to do that, and to do that, and to do that, and the, the developers they like crazy trying to follow the requests, or, okay? And when you change the schema, you change the applications, you change everything, it's a kind of crazy thing, okay? So you cannot follow in this way. So we have a kind of trade-off in the static schemas. They are good if you have something really designed and predefined, but they are bad when you want to connect freely the things, okay? You can see the same thing in XML. XML is basic in strong schemas, okay? So you have several standards, okay? And when you want to connect one standard to the other standard, you see a lot of work. For example, there is a committee trying to put ABCD together with STD. So they study and they see how we, this is like that, and they, you, you spend a lot of effort to put standards together. So this is the problem when you have a static schema. Then in computer science, starting an area we call data spaces. The, the principle of data spaces is inspired in the linked data. Okay? The basic principle is pay-as-you-go integration. What is pay-as-you-go integration? The basic idea is I don't want to do a heavyweight integration. I don't want to align schemas and do strong things. I want to connect what I have and step by step integrate things. So uh, data spaces, the idea comes from the idea of linked data. So if you saw this graph I showed in the linked data, the idea is the same. You start linking things. You don't care about integrating schemas, you start linking, and then you start to use these links to integrate data, and so on. And uh, the last argument is complex networks. I don't know if you heard about complex networks. It's an idea that a lot of researchers are, are putting some effort now. And the basic idea of complex network, we are now working with a professor in Brazil, which is a specialist in this area. Luciano, and, uh, and uh, this area is uh, started to be really strong development since 99. So it's almost a new area. And the basic idea is you can represent discrete systems, okay, in terms of entities and relationships. And entities and relationships are a graph, okay. So you can, may imagine some problems you can think. For example, here is a problem that I work with uh, one student in a, in a paper, okay, which is a nursery problem. There is diagnosis here, okay, and in this case, a kid, there, there are two patients with two cases here, okay, and we want to know when you find, for example, some kind of symptom, okay, how much is the, how is the, the probability or is the uh, the probability of occurring some kind of diagnosis, okay? So you want to analyze that. You put that in a graph and you start to analyze your graph. 
So this is the idea of complex networks. You can even represent, for example, in graphs, physical relationships, like there are researches in neurons, which is the nodes, and connections with the edges. Could be force relationships in physics, for example, grains and force vectors can be nodes and edges. Okay, social relationships, conceptual relationships. You can imagine any kind of relationship, put in a graph, and do your research. Okay, so then I spend the first part telling you, oh, let's put everything in a graph. Okay, if I'm going too, too quick, you can tell me, okay? If uh, I can slow down or you can do a, ask questions. Uh, this was the last question, if uh, perhaps you uh, are about to, to answer. Uh, exactly what your language, you, you talked about uh, the, uh, like that we can uh, ask like, uh, a graph that has a fast link data. Is there how we do that? Uh, yeah, like I will show that now. Okay. We, how you query these things. How you ask something to a graph. So this is the challenge now. Okay, okay, you convince me you put things in a graph, but what I you ask to this graph? So, okay, in how I you do that? Okay. So there are query languages to do that. Uh, let's consider we have our Triceratops, okay? Natural History Museum here. It's, there is a school of this Triceratops, okay? And I want to put it in a graph, okay? It's something like that, okay? I have a node here with the number of it, and I can put here um, some properties of this, this Triceratops, okay? And we have labels here. I, I, I start I start it slowly afterwards. So the idea is two two moments. Okay, the first moment I show all the concepts and so on. Then I will show practical examples. Okay, so you have this graph here, and then uh, you see here Lens Creek. Okay, Lens Creek is a place. Okay, and you tell me, but where where is this place? Okay, where is Lens Creek? Okay, so. Uh, I can tell you that Slans Creek is part of this county, which is part of this state in the United States, which is in the United States. So, so you can see here that I can exploit the graph, for example, to get this node and now connect to a chain of uh, uh, regions, which is part of the other region, and so on and so forth. Okay? Then I will get some Tyrannosaurus here, okay? and I will do the same thing. So I, it's Hell Creek in another area, okay? But now I want to study the interaction of these two guys, okay? I want to see how much, for example, is they are uh, nearby, they live it in the same time and so on and so forth, okay? What do you do? Okay, so uh, South Dakota and Wyoming, in fact, uh, in the United States are nearby, okay? And there are observations of both in Hell Creek and Lens Creek here. And I can have a graph here showing that both guys share a kind of common area here. I didn't give a name, but I can give a name, a desert or something, I don't know, but some area here which come on in both guys here, okay? And I can do queries like, uh, is, is it possible that these guys, these uh, animals here, they interacted in this area? Okay, and how do you do that if I'm working with graphs? Okay, the the basic principle, and and, and the second part, I will show practical examples. But uh, before that, before that, how can I know that? How can I get this data? Because you can tell me, okay, you are telling that, but it's not so easy to have the map of all uh, regions in the world and how they are part of the other part. And I will tell you, it's easy. <laughs> because, for example, you have, uh, in the linked data basis, you have one we call geonames. And what geoname does? You can find a place, okay? And it will tell you, as a graph, uh, which is part of which, okay? So, for example, I can get the information of this is part of that, which is part of that, which is part of that. Uh, just going to link it to the to the geonames and get this data, okay? And I'll show you a project we did, we exploited that, okay? So, uh, 
then when you have this, how I go to the graph to find the information I need. There are two approaches. The one, pro one approach we call process by pattern. And the other is process by inference, OK? This is much more related to ontologies, OK? And this is much related to graph without semantics, OK? Not, not without semantics, but we don't exploit the explicit semantics, OK? So for example, uh, in graph database, I can do a query like find the species whose origin, OK? And then there are vertex, OK? or zero O or many, so I can express that in my query language to United States. Oh, sorry, this is in Portuguese, okay? This is United States in Portuguese, okay? <laughs> Usa, okay? So I, I want to express this, and I can do that in my query language, okay? So my query language, my graph query language, so we have several query languages, but I will show you Cypher, which is a query language for one uh, for graph database, and, and there are also SparkyL, okay? SparkyL is from RDF, which is also a graph, okay? So uh, in this case, I will find just a pattern. The query language you look for a pattern which matches this thing and give me. So which pattern he is looking for? So uh, this, we can see that this will be a, 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 a node. This is in a vertex, okay? And uh, the orange will, will be something that in several levels can be part of a nice thing. So this is just a pattern. This is a way to do the things, okay? This is more quick, but less powerful. Why is less powerful? Because you, may, you need to express in advance the pattern you want, okay? The second approach is if you start to put some meaning in the things. If you start to express some meaning, so for example, uh, the part of relationship, I can tell this is a kind of relationship which is transitive. For example, if A is part of B and B is part of C, so A is part of C. So this rule, and I can express this kind of rule, okay, will tell me that no matter when many, as many levels I have, Okay, if something is part of something, I can go up, up, up until I find what I want, okay? And I can have another rule telling, if A has origin B and B is part of C, so A has origin C. These two rules together uh, will allow me to ask, find the species whose origin is United States, okay? And it will give me the answer inferring. I don't need to express in my query, okay? In the, in the query, I just saw what's the, or, which, whose origin is United States, and then it will do the inference to find the proper, uh, the proper place, okay? So here you start to see a bit of difference when you look on graphs and when you work on ontologies, okay? Because when you work, uh, an ontology will be also a graph, okay? But it's a special kind of graph where we are concerned with the meaning of the concepts. We have a specific way to express the semantics of the things, the relations, the rules, the inference, and so on and so forth. Another thing you can do is look on the topology of the graph. And once you look at the topology of the graph, um, several years ago, Google uh, changed the way we look for information. Uh, doing a research in which he looks for the topology of the graph. So the, the thing is, you are looking for a page, okay? So consider each node of the graph is a page, okay? And you want, you are looking for a page based on a keyword, okay? So they designed an algorithm they call page rank. The basic idea is, the most important page will be the page of more other pages points to it, okay? So this guy here will be the page I'm looking for. It's the more relevant for my research, okay? So this is a kind of topology of the graph. I will look on the graph to see which node has more guys pointing to it. But there are other kinds of topology. For example, 
there are some ca cases in, in, in that is one node that divides two groups and we, we, I need to pass through these nodes to connect these two groups. They are not connected by themselves. If you look, for example, in this graph here, you see this kind of thing. You see, this node here is a kind of connection between this group and this group here, and this node here, and this node here, and so on. So the, the basic idea is this topology tells me something. Okay? If I'm looking for connections in neurons, for example, or if I'm looking for social networks, this is, tells me something. Okay? And I can do algorithms. So, uh, for example, uh, my student, uh, in this example I told you, okay, uh, Celso is designing a query language to express topology requests, okay? So you write a request when you ask for something concerning topology, okay? So the basic idea, for example, retrieve candidates of diagnosis relevant to a patient based on the symptoms and correlations with other similar patients. So this thing, I can write in a query language which my student is uh, working on, okay? So we did that, we published the paper to show that. We can show, we can look at the topology and we can answer questions. So uh, now we are looking on going from data spaces to ontologies. The basic idea is the following. Consider you have databases here. You have several bases with several things you are interested, okay? And then you want to integrate them in some way, okay? And, or you want to have more semantics related to these things, okay? So our proposal is in the middle of the way we can have a graph, okay? And this graph will be used to link the data to integrate things, to find concepts, and to connect these things to ontologies, okay? And I show you how we are doing that. So one of the wor works we did last year, which is really interesting, and is a proof of concept, in fact, is the following. We got uh, 11,000 spreadsheets, okay, from the web but they are biology spreadsheets, okay? And which kind of spreadsheets we are looking for? We are looking for two kinds of spreadsheets. The first group is observations. So people that have spreadsheets observed animals, birds, frogs, something on the field and has geolocation, characteristics, and so on and so forth. And the other group is something that tries to organize uh, in, in a kind of taxonomy. So, um, kingdom, phylum, family, and so on and so forth. So, we did a kind of automatic algorithm that went to Google, put some keywords, and got 11,000 spreadsheets automatically. And run this algorithm to try to extract the data and interpret it. So, th there is a student that did that. And it achieved it to transform the data in an ontology. But in fact, this is the final result. Because in the, in the middle, we produced a graph, and we started to look. I will show you something. Uh, uh, nodes that tells about the same species, about the same region, and so on and so forth. We start to connect that. We collect the data from the DBpedia, for example, if you have some string talking about a place, we go to the DBpedia to see which place is this, to georeference it, to put it in an ontology of places, and so on and so forth. We combine all this data, and we produce an application, which is online, which you can go to a region in the map, click on it, and you'll find, for example, a bird here, okay? And you tell you all the information he got in 11,000 spreadsheets of this bird integrated, okay? In fact, uh, we even could produce automatically, okay, a kind of big taxonomy combining the data of all spreadsheets we got. 
So if you go here, you, you see kingdom and philon and so on and so forth, which is a kind of connection. If you think this approach to combine parts of DNA, right? When you, when you do the sequencing, okay? You have this approach is the blast, right? You have a lot of pieces of DNA and you put them together to produce a chain. So we did that to produce this kind of phylogenetic here. And you can tell me, what is the rel reliability of this data? It's zero, <laughs> in the sense that we got uh, aleatory spreadsheets on the web. And how did you do that? It's just to prove that we can extract, we can combine, we can integrate. Even though this, we don't have um, we don't have the quality and the provenance of this data because it's spreadsheets on the web. We show it, we can do that. We can extract, we can integrate, we can put the data together. Okay, another example which we work at together, uh, uh, Regine and Aiz and me and Eduardo, which is the student that did that, we got several files, XML files, and uh, we run out, put in a graph database and we run algorithms first. There are, there are seven files of the Varanus gen, genus, okay? And they are, if you see, they are graphs that are not connected. And then we run, so there are seven subgraphs here, okay? Not subgraphs, there are seven, seven graphs that are not connected. And then we run an algorithm to find which species are the same using an LSID service. And afterwards, we compare the, the we started to compare the the characters, okay, to find common characters. And so the the basic idea in this works is we started to raw, from raw data and try to run kind of automatic algorithms to go up in the semantic hierarchy to find the meaning behind the things, okay. So uh, another thing you can do is you can evaluate similarity of things, okay? And I show you an, uh, an interesting result of research of one of my students. The thing is, consider you want to evaluate the similarity of two things, okay? So you are looking for something and you want to evaluate the similarity. So uh, in this case, consider you want to evaluate the similarity of three words, okay? I want to know if district attorney, okay, is more similar to judge than to child. So this is the principle of similarity. I have three things and I want to know if this is more similar than that or than that, okay? And what do you think? No, no, not, not based on the tree here, but based on your knowledge. If I'm telling, I'm looking for judge, okay? And I tell, I have here district attorney, okay? You know what is the district attorney? He's a kind of public lawyer, okay? He's in, in the judiciary uh, system, okay? Do you think this is more near to that than this one? What do you think? Probably uh, district attorney is near then you, you are, okay, you agree with me that it's much more than child, eh? okay? And, and this is the essence of similarity, but the question is, why do you think that? We have a referential in our, wait, objectively, it's, 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 it's not the same. Depends, so if you try, if you try to, if you try to evaluate the distance counting edges, okay? Okay, so you go one, two, three, and here you go one, two, three. You say the same, okay? So, so this is the... Huh? We have other values, I mean, we put other attributes to child that are not the same. Yeah, but there is something really interesting. There is a researcher called Resnick that found something which is the size of the universe, which is the following. Consider that there is a universe of things, which is people involved in official functions like lawyers, judges, in, in this judge system, okay? And there are other universes, all persons in the world, okay? These are two groups, right? 
is even though in the in the in the tree there are no sizes okay if you imagine that these two groups have sizes they probably will be like that okay so all persons in the world will be that size and the official functionalities will be that size okay and so for this reason when you compare you think that judge is more similar to uh, to the district attorney because the universe they share is much more similar okay so w whenever we do similarity comparisons we look on the size of the universe okay so and we can do for many things so this is an example comparing for example two kinds of virus this is a real ontology and i show that if you counting edges you tell me that a plant is more similar to a tobacco virus than a varula virus okay if you counting edges okay but there is another technique in which you can see the common ancestor and you tell me, since this common ancestor is more specific between these two guys than this common ancestor, so these two virus is more similar than the same virus in the plant. But the problem is, if you go to the uh, district attorney again, the problem is sometimes you don't have a common ancestor. So if you go to this example I showed you, there is no common ancestor between this and this, okay, in the ontology. I mean entity which is the most generic thing which means nothing in our case okay so if you don't have this you cannot apply this approach to compare things because there is no common set and this is really common so uh, if you have this approach of the size of the universe i'm not going details but is what you call information content you can compare and see what's more similar than what okay and then uh, how the problem is how do you know the size of the universe okay this is the problem so if you go back to the, this work i showed of my student that went on the web got tags okay you remember that we got millions of tags and we uh, put this uh, information statistical information in the ontology and you use that to do the measures of the sizes okay so then i can know if this is near or it is big if it is, if it is small and we can use it to compare things and we show it that when you use this information the comparisons is much more reliable is much more precise than if you don't use it okay so this is a way to show you that we can track things from the web put in the graphs and use them to find the things we want okay so this is we can tell is the first part okay I don't know if it was too quick okay but one hour is the first part to show you what is the context why we need graphs how we use graphs now we have the second part which is how we do that <laughs> okay uh, do we want to follow or stop by go ahead okay so now let's go to the to the details okay okay how do you do that how, how what is this kind of thing graph database exactly okay so now first there is the graph model there is still um, uh, probably you ever I mean there is no single graph model it's not like relational database there is one model okay we have several competing models and I think two are the most uh, used most uh, probably most frequent and you uh, exist in the next years okay the first is we call RDF graph and it came from semantic web from the standards of the semantic web and in some sense even though it's used to build ontologies and to produce semantics we can use and see it also as a simple graph model so we can use rdf as many people are doing now just to do graphs even if you don't care about semantics okay so uh, how is the principle of the rdf graph you have a triple resource property and value okay so the principle is everything you could represent in this way so 
resource is something you are describing, then you have a property and then you have a value, and it becomes node edge node. Okay? Sometimes your property or your value is also a resource. Okay? So we use to 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 devise both cases. We use a uh, rectangle to, to tell that this is a literal. A literal is something that will never become uh, a resource. Okay? It's a kind of final node. Okay? But if you, the value you want could be a resource, it becomes another node like that. Oval, okay? And if something is a resource, you can go ahead infinitely in sense. Resource, property, value. This now is a resource, property, value. And you can go and go and go. So the basic principle, let's consider I want to represent my plesiosaurus as an RDF graph. Okay? So I must have a resource which can be, for example, in my case, the, the identification of the the plesiosaurus in the museum, okay? And then I must have uh, an edge, for example, telling size, okay? And then I have a value here, 5, okay? I'm simplifying the RDF. There are several details I'm not show here because if I go to the details, I will spend all the time just talking about RDF. But this is the principle, okay? Resource, property, value, okay? Then I can go further and tell you, okay, the, uh, so you see here, resource, property, value, resource, property, value. So I tell, resource recognized in this epoch, okay? And you can go further. So now, let's say, I want resource, property, value, but now this guy here is in another resource, okay? So I have triple, resource, property, value, okay? But... Uh, I can even have resource, property, value, property, value. Again, I can go forward. Okay? But the principle in RDF is that each node, each node just has just the node and the label. Okay? Nothing more. You cannot put extra values here. Nothing. So if, for example, I want to tell that there is something related to this guy, I must produce an edge and a valley, okay? This approach has advantages and disadvantages, okay? What is the advantage? The advantage is, is as simple as possible, okay? And what is the disadvantage? It's too prolix, okay? Because sometimes I want to tell a lot, a lot of things about this node, and I produce a huge graph with several uh, edges to tell about the thing. So this, is, uh, this produces a kind of overhead to the system because you produce millions of uh, edges to produce things. Okay? So, uh, okay. Uh, sometimes, for example, consider here I'm, cons I, I'm producing the... This is a species, for example. Okay? So, uh, the basic idea is one principle uh, we start using a lot in graphs, and I show you, is uh, the, the way you identify things. So, in this case, for example, we have, uh, instead of putting the identification as the name, Plesiosaurus, okay, instead of putting that, I want to identify these, these species in another way, which is independent of the, the writing, okay? And why I, can, why I want to do that, okay? There are several reasons, okay? This kind of, there is a kind of identification, for example, life sciences ID, which is a number, for example, which is independent of uh, anything, okay? And it's important, it is a, an approach to identify things we use in computer science, we call surrogate. The surrogate approach is important because, for example, consider the name 
changes along the time, okay? So you now have this, I, I don't know, it's Triceratops, then I want to call Torosaurus, and I change the things, but I want to refer the same guy. So if I use something that is independent of everything, I can just show, change the label, for example, okay? So, and then I produce a node with some identification, and then I can produce uh, labels, and a label in Portuguese, for example, and so on, okay? So, it is what we call identifying by surrogates, okay? In this case, the LSAD is a surrogate to identify things. But if you are talking about LDF, in fact, the way we use to identify things is URIs. This is the way we use, okay? URIs is the way we, uh, a kind of unique identifications of the things we want, okay? And there are many sites now that are combining the idea of surrogates and URIs. So you have an URI, and at the end of the URI you have a number. And I show you in the geospace, in the if you remember the the the, the geo names, okay? Each region has a number, okay? There is no name there, just the number, okay? And why they do that? They combine the idea of URI and surrogate, okay? Which is important. Okay, I, I, I will use this reduced form sometimes to represent the URI. So this is... RDF. And in RDF, the interesting thing, you can start to connect this to that, which connect to that, to connect to that. So you produce uh, a graph of nodes, okay? And then you can use a language we call SparkyL, for example, to go to this graph, okay? But RDF has more than that. RDF, uh, 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 you can, I, I didn't show here because my, our focus today is graphs, okay? But you can produce, a, um, you have a formal uh, semantic system to describe this is a class, this is a concept, this is an instance, so you produce an ontology. So for this reason, uh, RDF is also used to produce ontologies and you can go to a more formal thing than that, okay? Another graph model, and I will show you the, the, the practical application now is the property graph, okay? So this way, now we will run something, okay? So we will run a Neo4j database, okay? So Neo4j database is a famous graph database manager which runs over the which runs over uh, uses gra uh, property graphs, okay? So let's, let's produce, I will produce a new database, the entire new database. So to produce a new database, you can just get a folder. For example, let's call it DinoDB, okay? So the DinoDB is a folder, and I open it. And now you see, I will start the database. Okay, it, the folder is empty, okay? Then I do start, and the system will produce a new empty database automatically, okay? Okay, so now let's start to do something in our new graph database. It has a web interface to interact with your server, okay? So you have a server database, and you have this graph interface here. And the importance to show you here practically is because you understand better the notion of graph database if you see it, if you look at it, okay? So let's start to play. Uh, so the, the, oh, uh, oops, it's opening. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So, uh, now I remember that uh, it's recording and it gets just part of the screen. It just gets this part of the screen here. It doesn't record everything. Wow.
Okay. If I will show something, because it will too. Okay. So um, let's consider now what's the property graph. So a property graph is different from the RDF graph for the following. You have nodes, okay, but now you can have a properties attached to the nodes, okay? So the node has something which is a property. A property has a name and a, a value, but is not part is not an edge of the graph. It's part of the node, okay? And you can have edges, and the edge can have also properties, okay? So the the difference of this model of comparing to the previous model is that you put properties on the things, okay? So let's go back to our plesiosaurus, okay? If you go back to our plesiosaurus, I will produce a node here. So let me get my, my examples to show you. Uh -huh. I I have some predefined examples. Okay, so so for example, I want to produce one dinosaur. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's let's do the following. I will I will do the following. Are you create? Are you type here? Oh, not here. Here. I will type here. Create. Okay, and when you put parentheses, you create a node. This is a node. Okay, but usually, usually, we have a special kind of property we call label. Okay, which uh, allows us to classify uh, nodes. Okay, so for example, consider I have a node which has a dinosaur. I can put here dinosaur. Oh God. Dinosaur, okay? Why we have this uh, two points here, I will explain after, okay? But here I have a, a node uh, with a dinosaur. So if I do play here, it created my node. Now I will see my database. Then you see a node zero here, which is orange. You see dinosaur here, okay? And, and and you can ask me, Andre, why it's showing another thing is that if the database is empty, it's showing person, place, and species. If you didn't put anything like that in the database, okay? It seems to me that this is a kind of uh, this does this is not in the database, okay? Uh, uh, this interface is a kind of clever interface, okay? So in previous databases. I put the persons, places, and species in previous one. And it, it remembers the classes I use it to show here. Okay? So it, it, it's a bit confusing because you think it is in the database, but there is nothing concerning persons, places, or species in the database. There are just dinosaurs, you see, which is the orange node. Okay? And you will see that this node in the, in the Neo4j has a unique identifier which is the number zero. It put unique identifiers as numbers, okay? So you can imagine that in RDF, the unique identifier is an UII. In Neo4j, the unique identifier is a number, okay? It starts from zero and then one, two, three, four, five, and so on, okay? Okay, so we produce a kind of uh, simple node, okay, without properties. Okay, but now I want to produce a uh, triceratops. Okay, so I put the create again. I put the node again, and I tell again that is a dinosaur. Okay, good. So, but now I want to put properties. So I put this symbol here. Okay, and be, uh, between them I can put properties values, properties values, properties values. So, for example. I can tell that the ID is, for example, no, it's not equal, sorry. I always do that. So I can tell ID is 
let me get the idea of the triceratops I have here. This is a triceratops in the museum. Okay? So I can put here the ID. Okay? So when I play it, it will produce a second node here now. Okay? Which is my triceratops. Okay? But in this case, you see that the system is clever. If I produce a uh, uh, property with the name ID, it shows there. But it still has his number. If I click on it, you see here that the, it's the one. You see one? So the unique identifier is not the ID. The unique identifier is one. Okay? And the ID is this one. You see a property. It shows a property. So it, it, the, the interface put this property in the node so it's easy to to look on it, okay? So it's, it's designed to do like that. It, this one, if you click on it, there are no properties, you see? And you can even configure the way you see the things. Huh? It's beautiful, right? You see that uh, you can configure that the caption will be, for example, the ID. But you can change to show the caption on anything else, okay? So it's like, okay. So uh, now we produce it a node, okay? So how we, and, and a node with properties, right? And how I produce a node with several properties. So I, here you see, I can put comma and another property and comma and another property and so on and so forth. But now let's create a node. Let's create, uh, let's say, an entire uh, description of a dinosaur, okay? So I will do the following. Uh, uh, I have here one create, you see, and let's see if you can follow me, okay? If it's too much, you can tell me, are you, oh God, the problem is, let me see, because I want to stay in this screen, because it's recording, but let me do the following, I'm doing this way, <coughs> no, not you. I get this guy here, so you can read it. And for people who is looking on the screen, this is the example, okay? So the basic idea here I have, let's, let's see if you follow the example, okay? First, I'm creating here uh, a dinosaur, okay, with ID and size, okay? Uh, what's the differences here? First, ah, let me change the ID, okay? Because I have a red one with this ID. So I call 21, just to have a different ID, okay? So, uh, what's the difference you can see here? Now you see before dinosaur, there is something here, you see? A kind of variable, okay? What's the purpose of this variable? It's just a local thing, okay? Because you see that this, this uh, statement has several parts. And here, I must refer to this node. Because this is a node. You see a node? So I want to refer to this node. So to refer to this node, I create a kind of local name, which will disappear after the comment, just to refer to it. Okay? Yeah. Yes, it's a kind of an alias, exactly. It's like in, in SQL, an alias. It exists only in the in the command and afterwards it disappears okay and why is it not the number of the node zero could be could be we avoid to use numbers because uh, uh, for example uh, uh, consider the whole is the, is the same yeah it's the same the yeah but uh, for example consider we store that in your files okay for the future okay and in the future if someone produce a new database, it could be another number, mm -hmm. not zero. So for this reason, we, we avoid to use the number. But you are right, we can use. We can use the number. So here, and, and also because sometimes, for example, now I'm creating now, so I don't know which number it will create, because this is new. Okay, so I don't know which number it will create. It will create now the number, right? So uh, what happens here, I'm creating a node here, 
like I did before, okay? A second node for a species, you see? The species Triceratops ohides, and a, tra a third uh, node for the place, okay? And then, now I want to do edges, okay? How I do edges? First, I represent the nodes I created by variables, okay? Like that. So this is a node, and this is a node, okay? And I represent uh, edges by an arrow, like that. And in the middle of the arrow, I put this thing and the label of the, the edge, okay? So this is, uh, means that this uh, dinosaur here were found in this place here, okay? Or this dinosaur here is a uh, Triceratops ohidus, okay? And as you can see, in the edge, I can also put properties, okay? So it's like that. Let me show you here. So what I did, I did the following. I first created a node with properties, okay, on it. And then I can create other nodes, okay? And these other nodes also can have properties, okay? And now what I want to do is create an edge which has properties, okay? So, uh, the, I want to tell here that, uh, in this case, I'm, I, I'm sh uh, for, so for example, oh, again, oh, God. Hmm? Probably put on the other table, right? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's not designed to use in this way, right? So, <laughs> so now it thinks that it's going good. Okay. So, uh, so in this case, um, I'm showing origin. Okay, I don't know if I show or I sh I call origin here. Uh, I don't know. I'm putting, in fact, here is different. I'm putting the, 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 the property here, telling that it was recognized as a plesiosaurus, right, in uh, this year. Okay, but I can put a property also in the found if I wish. Okay, so when I do play here now, you will see uh, now that, uh, let me do the following. Oh, well, I was kicking here. So you will see here now, I have a graph with the new Triceratops here, the species here, and the place here. Okay? You see? And you see you have found here, and if you click on found, no properties, but is a, it will show me, recognize it in this year. And then you can ask me, but Andre, where is the schema? <laughs> you don't need to define the schema in advance. There is no schema. Forget it. <laughs> there is no schema. This is the way we create the graphs. It's just creating, okay? You just have this crazy way <laughs> to do the things, okay? This has advantages and disadvantages, okay? The thing is that you can show you, when you open a new database you don't know, you are, the first question is what, is, what is the schema? And you don't know the schema, so how you do your queries? So this is one thing we discuss a lot, okay? But now, for example, consider now a, a new problem. I want to connect also this vertex to this triceratops ohidus okay, here, right? So the thing now is, first, I want to find the node, I want to find this node, I want to match this node, and then I want to connect this node to this node, okay? In some sense, I, might, I want to look, find this, this, so I want to match this, match this, and then connect both, okay? 
This is the challenge. So then I introduce you to a new, a new statement we call match. Okay, match is the way we look on patterns on the graph, and we find things. So for example, match some dinosaur where the ID is this one, which is this one. You see? So this statement will match for this specific node here. And dn will represent it. In, so in some sense, the number of the node is here now in the end, okay? When you match it, okay? Then, okay, this is the first node. Oh, sorry. Uh, I cannot do enter. <laughs> No, let's let me put all the all the statements. So first I will match this node. Okay? Then I will match uh, not the lens creek. I want to match the triceratops ohidus. So let me get the species. Okay? So I want to match the species. Oh, could be the place. It's, uh, let, let's put the place. Okay. So I want to match this place here. So I want to tell this is found here also. Okay. So I want to match the place. Then I create an edge linking this guy to this guy who is following. Okay. So when I do play here and I request to, I, I want to see the graph again. Now you see that now both dinosaurs are connected with Lance Creek. You see? They are both connected with Lance Creek. So in this way, I can uh, go following, go and connect and connect and connect and connect things. So the match is the essence uh, the match is the sense of the way I find things. So, for example, let me show you here. I can write, for example, um, match. Okay? So, it's like that. I put match, and the thing I want, for example, I, I put the, say, a dinosaur. Okay? And I put a where, which like SQL in the sense that I can put, okay, the idea of dinosaur, of this dinosaur is, let's say, uh, this one, okay, okay, so, um, but I want to know, okay, uh, I want to know uh, the species of this dinosaur, okay, I want to know what is the species of this guy? So I match it to him, okay? But now I want to match a second thing. I don't know, eh, okay? I want to match a second thing, which is this dinosaur, okay? Must have an edge, okay? Is a, right? Is a edge. Where is is a, so it has an edge, is a. Okay. To some second edge, which is the species. Okay. So you see, uh, the the open this no this guy I know, this guy I know this I don't know. So if you try to match to find sp. No, it will try to find. No, no. Do you understand? Yeah. Well, in this case, when you do the query, you put some open guy here. Okay? We just create the, the link. No, you do not create. You try to match something that. So, the, the end. So, you try to find everybody, okay, who has this ID. So, it will be the end. Okay? <coughs> And then you try to match all the guys that has is a link to SP. And then I tell him, oh God, 
wrong, wrong, uh, yeah. And, uh, it's shift enter. Yeah, shift enter. Return SP. Now, oh. it shows something? No. Let me see how it shows. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you are right, you are right. I must show uh, sp dot, uh, dot id. Yeah, it shows, but where? Here? No, it's done zero rows. Oh, zero rows. It, 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 Ah, it's 21. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Just a number. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anais. Thank you. So, did you understand or not? So, uh, uh, if you use SPAKL, which is RDF, it's the same thing. Just change syntax. I can show you. It's the same thing. You put a pattern. And you have uh, open guys here, and it goes to the graph and try to find who matches the pattern and returns you the open guys. Okay, so this is the basic principle. Okay, and I can even, if I wish, to tell that I have, for example, zero or more. So if I want to f to match this pattern of part of. Okay, but I don't know how many part offs I have. Okay, I can tell. I I I I I'm interested in thinking that it has one or more part offs. So we try to find uh, someone in, in the several levels which match the pattern to give me the answer. Okay, so all the rationale behind graph database is based on matching patterns. Okay. And so, but but I, but then there is a there is a, uh, the the question is so for example how uh, if uh, I don't have any schema okay I must trust in the patterns yeah so in this sense these have advantages and disadvantages okay uh, so the advantage is the freedom I show with you. You don't need any schema. You don't need nothing. You start to connect things. This is good. Okay. On the other hand, if, you, for example, if you try, if you start to, to connect graphs, and you don't have any kind of policy, okay, people start to put names, same names in the edges to different meanings. So it can become a kind of mess. Okay. And uh, sometimes, if you look on the graph and you don't find you don't know the scheme or nothing. How do you find the things you want? Okay. So for this reason, this is still a work in progress. So for example, for my students, when they work, for my students, when they work with graphs, I ask them to produce a kind of model <laughs> to show me the pattern they you follow to produce the graph. It's not a, a schema because there is no schema, but is a is a model so I can see and I can uh, I can interpret the things how they are okay in the case of RDF is not exactly like that you can have uh, you can have uh, an RDF schema if you want okay but an RDF schema is there are two differences of the traditional schemas you know okay first the RDF schema is also a graph is part of the graph okay and the second difference is that RDF is based in the open world assumption. What's the idea of open world assumption? Even though I have a schema, okay, the schema doesn't tell me all the all the thing I have, so it's not constrained. So I can have things out of the schema. The schema just uh, guides me to interpret the things, but I can produce nodes outside the schema as I wish. So there is no constraint to be inside the schema. You can never tell that something 
is not accepted because of the schema is different from the relational database, which is a closed world assumption. The principle of closed world assumption is that I know all about the thing I'm, I'm doing, I have control, so I can tell you what's wrong, what's right. Okay? So this is the open world or the closed world assumption, which is the base of the relational database to, to enforce consistency, for example. So if, for example, you tell that um, a field is not new, and someone try to put something with no, it will not accept, right? This is relational database. You cannot do that here, nor in, not, neither in the, this graph database, nor in the RDF. Even if you have an schema, you can do, not do that. Because it's open. It, I mean, if, you can even have contradictory things. You can have someone that tell cannot be new, and the other you it, it can be new, and you have this contradictory thing. So it's, Yeah. Yeah, you're right. On the other hand, you can, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you are right. So, this is not a silver bullet. This does not replace all the storage we have. So, the basic idea, and people in the design is aware on that, there are specific applications for graph databases. So, they, they are not designed to replace the relational database, and we are not considering that, okay? So they're not, so if you have applications, you have uh, some static schemas, and you want to follow with that, it's much better to use a relational database. It's easier, it's more uh, efficient, and so on. But what we are, we are trying to do is put both together, try to put both together. Uh, how do we manage, perhaps stupid question, but how do we manage millions of Representation. It can represent like huge amount of data. Yes, but this question is good. I mean, I show just a small part part of the graph database. Okay, we have the problems we have in the relational database. For example, efficiency. So, for example, you cannot just start querying things, and the system goes to all nodes to find what you want. So we have indexing options here. We can index nodes, okay? So I can produce an index, for example, for labels of nodes. So, uh, for example, I want to index the dinosaurs. I can do that in this system, and it indexes just the dinosaurs. It finds quickly the dinosaurs because there is an index for that. Okay. okay? You have a, a, like, kind of entries that you can visualize. Yeah, so, so it does the following. You, you produce, you, you create an index, okay? okay. And, and uh, so, for example, I know that I have queries that start from the name, from, from the dinosaurs, the, the, the name of the dinosaur or something, okay? So I ask for the database, I, I define the, 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 the label or the class of the nodes I want to avoid to index everything, because sometimes you want to index some it's like in the relational database. You want to index a table, right? So, and, and then... But right. here, what you have uh, above... Uh, here uh, is no index. No, 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 no here, yeah. If we, we can't, if we have hundreds of thousands of data, we can't visualize in a... Ah, visualization, you mean visualization? Well, visualization is still a huge challenge, okay? okay. Is this still a huge challenge and uh, I, 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 I want, I have a student now uh, which started a project which we call uh, Linked Scales. So the basic idea is, the, the basic idea is the following. Yeah, exactly that. So the, the problem we have, in, even in ontologies, is if you have a big ontology or if you have a big graph, when you open it, you see a kind of millions of dots, okay? So we are looking for, can we, um, in some sense, aggregate things or, or select things so you can have layers like scales. You zoom in and you zoom out and you see things like that. So this is one thing we are trying to do, okay? But there is a hot area in computer science they call graph summarization. 
Graph summarization is an area they try to produce graphs summarizing another graphs. Okay. So they, there are a lot of people working on that, and depending on the thing you are want to summarize and so on and so forth, they try to do things. Um, so, um, not technical question, but is it what we uh, part of what we call the no SQL database? Yes. Okay. So this is part of okay. the universe of the no SQL no database. SQL. I mean, there are several approaches for no SQL database, and graph database is one of them. Okay. okay? There are other kinds of no. There is column databases. There is other things, but uh, this is one of the guys. Yes. No issue. Huh? No issue. Yeah. You try to read. When you read about it, it's not like, okay, but it's true. Okay. Yeah. 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 The, the origin of these no SQL databases is because, for example, for graphs, uh, as we do here. Okay. Uh, when the thing you want to to look is typically a graph, okay? So let's consider the problem. Let's consider the problem of finding, this is a classic problem of a graph. Let me show you here, which is, why is important to do that? Uh, so for example, uh, let's get this problem here, which is a recursive, uh, yeah, is a recursive thing here, okay? If you do that in a relational database, uh, you'll be a mess, yeah. okay? Because the, the, the relational database is not designed to do that. So it's a typical uh, graph query, okay? And as that, there are several others. I can show you queries, uh, classical queries, and I can show you the when I look on the topology, is how you look at topology of something if it's not a graph, okay? So for this kind of problems, uh, the, the, the queries are much more efficient if you use a graph database, okay? And so, for example, if you get, get Facebook, Facebook now has a graph database below everything. So they, they design... Huh? It depends. Google depends on what you are doing. Google is not a graph database necessary. For the, for the search engine, no. It's a different thing. Okay, it's, it's other kinds... No, it's is no SQL, but it's not a graph database, yeah. And, and, but Facebook uh, now designed a graph database because they, they, they deduce that the things they do want to query, the thing they do want to find is much more graph. So, so, for example, when they do, when they suggest something for you, you enter in the Facebook and it suggests the, the best things that the, your friends are doing, okay? So this is, uh, this is an area in, in, in graphs we call recommendation, okay? And these topology things I show with you, okay? They are used to recommend things to you, okay? So they look on the topology of the graph, for example, something like that, and they try to find, oh, this is something that uh, many people are interested, so I will show that to you. So it, it does that. So, so these algorithms to, to recommend things, they, they use a lot of graph topology. So, and, and we need a graph database to do that. So for this reason, they are looking, they are work, going towards graph database, okay? And, and, and now their database, for example, you can even query on it. You can, they have a service and you can query on the Facebook. But the constraint is uh, your, your account. So you can query on Facebook what you can see as user, okay? You cannot, uh, you cannot query things of uh, people you are not allowed to see, okay? It's not, yeah. They are the, otherwise, you may imagine what the people you do, right? So uh, there is this constraint, but... Yeah. You see? I don't know if you want to see more examples of graph, but the basic idea is just show you uh, the concept, right? And, for example, what will be if we have a relational database and we want to connect to a graph database? What will be in this case, okay? So, the, the, the common approach could be a linked data approach, okay? So, for example, consider... Uh, in this example, 
Oh, let me just finish something about the graph, which is interesting. Um, uh, this property on the edge, okay, is hard to represent in RDF, okay? It's hard, because since edges in RDF, they don't have properties. If I want to represent this thing, for example, in RDF, this guy has discovery and this origin, uh, so consider I have the origin, okay? I must produce some kind of node here <laughs> to put place and discover it, something like that. Okay, so sometimes the but uh, uh, but both model they are compatible in the sense you can map everything from one number to the other. Okay, so doesn't matter the model you f you you choose, the expressivity is the same. Okay, it, they are just more uh, simple to do some tasks and harder to do other tasks. Are more or less efficient according of what you want to do, but. Uh, Consider you want to represent, connect this thing to a relational database, right? So what I have in the relational database, for example, I can have stored this uh, plesiosaurus, for example, in the uh, expert tree base. Someone is describing the plesiosaurus, me, for example, okay? So uh, what happens here is, uh, I can represent this guy in a OAI. So several people use Neo4j, okay, I use it like that, putting OAIs in the nodes. So this ID I showed you, I put an OAI. So if you got, for example, the Eduardo's work, all the nodes are identified by OAI. So it becomes automatically linked data because anyone can address my nodes Okay, so if I put an YHI here and in the relational database I identify things with YHIs, it's easy to match them and to connect both. Okay, so I think this is one of the best approaches if we want to do the thing. If we want to connect uh, uh, different uh, applications, uh, we need to add this, uh, exactly the, the same thing. We, we create a database uh, with uh, the nodes are the URI of the repo, the, the taxon name of the, the descriptor of the state. Yes, exactly. And, and we can link... Um, uh, no. We can put the same way here. Yeah. 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 Will be like that, and and the thing is, as we discussed, it, the the impact is not so big because, for example, you can stay as you are now, for example, and you can automatically produce AIs based on the combination of the application name plus that plus that plus that. If you can guarantee that each one is unique in the in the base, you you produce an AI. You don't need to store it in the database. Okay. But if we want to link data from different applications, we have to uh, control if even if the same level is the same thing. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Like, like yeah, you are right. You are right. In the sense that, yeah, you are right. So in this sense, if we automatically produce YIs, okay, we will never have... Uh, the same nodes pointing to two applications. Yeah, we will never have that. We must say always produce a copy mm -hmm. and use a, an edge we call same as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be we'll be more. So we must. This is this is an an, an interesting. Uh, uh, this is interesting. A commentary, interesting commentary. So yes, we we must think about that because it's. Probably we must see the the trade-off of uh, of uh, producing automatically because the produce if we produce automatically it has low impact in the application, right? You just produce them uh, automatically. But if you need to store them, there is a high impact because they must change all the ID things in the in everything, so it's it's harder, right? So. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, I think uh, uh, we must see the impact of both cases, right? Because in this case, we, we must have one node for each application, and then we put same as or derive it or something and and go in this direction, right? We never use the same. Okay, so this is one thing. And I have a student which is who is working in the versioning in these graphs. So so we are working in versions on graph database. The basic idea is if the graph evolves, how you keep track of the changes? Okay, so we can use it. As an example, the changes in the, for example, if you have a graph representing the expert and this graph changes, how we keep track of the changes, okay? How we keep track, how we store it, how we retrieve, and so on and so forth, right? Other questions? So. This is the, the, the summary of the things. If you are interested in more things, we keep 